Wonderful. Well, good morning, everyone. Hello again. I am Amanda Clark uh, from Whitworth University, the library director there. And I had the pleasure of opening this symposium. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our final speaker, Dr. Nancy Steinhardt, who will deliver our keynote lecture, followed by an open discussion. Uh, we've had much to discuss these past few days, and we never seem to have enough time. So I hope we do have some good discussion today after this keynote address. Um, we've woven a web of architecture, intention, theology, photography, and explored the unique storytelling of the urban environment. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Nancy Steinhardt, a Harvard graduate and a 2021 recipient of the prestigious Society of Architectural Historians Alice Davis Hitchcock Book Award for her Princeton publication, Chinese Architecture, A History. Dr. Steinhardt is a professor of East Asian art and a curator of Chinese art at the University of Pennsylvania. I have the pleasure of serving alongside her on the Society of Architectural Historians Board of Directors, and I came to learn of her groundbreaking research in Chinese architecture while I was a student. Uh, even receiving one of her books, Nancy, you don't know this, as a prize for a best paper award when I was a student oh, oh, on the topic. <laughs> she has published dozens of articles and books. Her publications are truly foundational for anyone interested in pursuing themes of Chinese architectural history. Nancy, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you virtually to Whitworth University and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I, I hope I can live up to that amazing, uh, amazingly generous introduction. I am truly honored to talk to you today about a subject that I've circled around, literally circled around but never had the opportunity to put together until this symposium. And what I mean by circled around is that as I mentioned yesterday, sometimes one has to look outside China at what is taken from the Chinese tradition by another tradition to understand what's most fundamental about the Chinese architectural tradition itself. So people all look to Japan, that's not a surprise. People look to Mongolia, but people also look in painting to a painting of Uyghur Buddhism with the Chinese pavilion projecting right here to an undated Manichaean painting where Mani is preaching under a Chinese roof and to Kublai Khan himself receiving the doctrine from Pogspa, his, his Buddhist Lama, painted around the 15th century somewhere in Tibet, and of course to Shinwazari, which we have uh, talked about already during the symposium. But actually, I first came to missionary literature and the kind of question that we talk about today, around 1990, when I was asked to write something on the Kaifeng Synagogue. And so I found out at that time that the first drawings of the Kaifeng Synagogue had been done by missionaries. Father Domenge made a drawing of this, which was copied by Father Brucker. And then it makes its way into a 20th century publication on the synagogue. Uh, many of you know, it's already come up that I wrote a book on early mosques in China, early meaning pre-modern. And uh, in that book, there are about 70 mosques and I'm showing you here pictures of them because from the exterior, one's first impression would always be that uh, she is looking at a Chinese building of some kind. China has a tremendously recognizable architectural tradition. But when I wrote that book, in part because I had already thought about um, 
the synagogue, I thought that I should have a little chapter on church architecture. In China, oh, I have a little chapter on the synagogue and two selected churches. Uh, oh, and these are interiors of mosques. So interiors, meaning if you know what floriated Arabic looks like, then you know you're in a mosque. And if you look at the decoration and decoration has also come up, you know you're in a mosque. But when you look at this ceiling or this ceiling, you don't know that. So the two churches I selected to try to answer the question or at least ask the question, does monotheistic architecture require something beyond what the Chinese tradition normally does were these two. And the church in Dali is new by the standards of church architecture in China and built in the period that's been the focus of our conference. And yes, we have brick, but we have the Chinese decoration. I think someone in this symposium referred to not this building, but a building like this as a Chinese, I think he said pagoda, but I'd call it a Chinese pavilion with the cross on top. And of course the Beitong, which some look at and see this, but I always look and see this. And I will have a little bit more to say about how important those pavilions are in just a moment. But the question really that's asked is what it takes for this profoundly recognizable Chinese architectural tradition. Pillars, bracket sets, roof with pronounced eaves, not necessarily in wood, but in brick, in stone, in metal or ceramic to break out of what I sometimes call the field defining truism of Chinese architecture. And what I mean by that is why do so many Chinese buildings look like so many other Chinese buildings? So here I have two buildings on the screen intentionally without labels. If a person reads Chinese, then she knows that you are looking at the hall of endless ultim ultimateness, of the hall of the endless ultimate, something Taoist. But structurally, you don't have a clue. And many people on the screen recognize the Hall of Supreme Harmony, but you would not know from anything on the exterior that this is a funerary temple to an Empress Dowager built around the year 1900. And this is a temple for paying homage to Confucius, this version of it built around the year 1700. And the garden tradition, landscape architecture with landscape overtaking more of the building complex. Chinese architectures, uh, architecture certainly fits in here and similarly residential. Why? Well, the fundamental building block of Chinese architecture is the module. We've heard about module, modules in this conference also. We heard about Durand, but every wooden piece of a Chinese building in principle is measured based on the cross section of a bracket arm with the ideal proportion for the most eminent construction being three to two golden ratio. And every Chinese building, no matter its material should be supported by pillars, which support beams, which have struts with roof purlins and with roof rafters and with a ceramic tile cover. And given that, the rank of the building is what distinguishes it, but not the function. And this, this idea of function also came up yesterday, form and function. The function of a building is never apparent in a traditional Chinese structure. And that's extremely important, but one can count bracket set uh, pieces and see whether there's a uh, pilaster and look at, see if, the, if there's a marble platform and always determine rank. But again, the function, one for funerary sacrifices, one for paying homage to Confucius, and these are even kind of similar function, but the function is not apparent. 
What that means is a person can come inside and these are uh, drawings from an 11th, 12th century architectural manual that offers four different configurations of interior space, which means in practice that one of the easiest transformations a builder can make is from a throne to an altar or vice versa. The, the eminence, the importance of the system in of the building in this ranking system is what's evident, but certainly not the function on the outside. In fact, the timber frame is the most adaptable of building traditions. Wood does rot, but wood is simple to replace. A tiny part of the building can replaced, be replaced if there's a fire or if there's wood without changing very much. And the system has as much longevity as any building system that I know of. Uh, excavation has found pieces of timber with this notching system at a Neolithic site outside of Shanghai. Here's the date. These are the building standards that I just talked about, the Chinese Ing Zhao Fa Shur, and slightly different notching system, but there are various notching systems. And when one replaces pieces during restoration at the Forbidden City before they get painted, they are cut with this notching system. The system works on the highest of the sacred peaks on more than 3,000 kilometers above sea level. The system works on an island. The system works in various climates. And so this question isn't just adaptability of function. The corollary to this question is, how is it that the emperor holds audience? How is it that the most important building in China the Hall of Supreme Harmony, where the emperor sits in judgment, is built with the same wooden framing system as a small temple in the countryside. And this, this building was built in the ninth century. The brick, of course, is added to keep it standing. But the Hall of Supreme Harmony is made of more than 10,000 pieces of wood, and they're all straight wood. Well, this has also come up in discussion, it's all about the decoration. The wooden frame allows itself to be decorated so that when one enters the buildings of the Forbidden City, or as we've seen the church, the decoration tells us where, what you're, the eminence of what you're looking at and it can become a shell for ceremony. And so ceremony or writ may be a better word in the context of what we're talking about uh, at this conference is ritual. So that the architecture becomes a shell for ritual. So that the, the operative here with all the change is that not only is it the decoration, but I've mentioned in, in uh, comments uh, the last two days, and so now I'm saying it more specifically, the roof is of ultimate importance because it rises above the low walls that enclose a Chinese built environment and people coming from the outside where these are supposed to be jurchen, but this is from a movie, so how the Jurchen are dressed, a people from Northeast Asia, uh, uh, circa late 12th, early 13th century, are coming from the outside. It's not the great wall that they see, it's these rooftops. And these rooftops tell them they're in China, and this is a symbol that will be very hard for China to ever give up. This is a system that's built by craftsmen. Once there's a plan and once someone knows the module, it's not even designed by great architects traditionally. There are building standards, there are books that are followed, there's a master craftsman, everything is put together. And it is a system that comes out of a greater system with art, architectural, and craft forms 
of extraordinary longevity, of extraordinary history, and of extraordinary of, of, an, of an extraordinarily serious looking back to the past. So what does separate it from the Chinese painting tradition? This is uh, all that's left. It's a sketch for a painting that doesn't survive from the 11th century and a painting surely made as a copy of it from the 13th century. The Chinese painting intentionally breaks out of its mold in the 17th century and architecture doesn't but the Chinese painting tradition can be rolled up and put in a pocket or put in a closet or put in the pocket of a sleeve. And when a building is built, even if it's a humble temple, it changes the built environment or it changes the environment around it. And it's assumed that it's going to stand longer than those who build it are on this earth. This is behind anything that's, that's built in China for any reason. So that when one begins with what does it take to build a church, I think there are four important factors and I'll start with one that's come up already. Uh, many would start with the use of permanent materials. Well, the church is not, and, uh, and I should say that this is not new to the churches that we've been looking at. In the Sinophone world, churches were built in the 17th century and in the 16th century of permanent materials across not just East Asia, but I've, I've gone here to Malaya um, just to make a point. The churches that we're looking at in China are far from the earliest ones. And here there is a distinction between the mosques. This won't be the only time the mosque comes up, but I bring it up here because this also came up in the symposium. The mosques that look, mosques that look like this only are built in China in, uh, after circa 1980. These are expressions of global Islam. And many of them are built with the help of people from outside China, and they look like mosques that one would see in many parts of the world, including the United States. The mosques that are built earlier to look like that are all in Xinjiang. They're in what's part of China today, but in the far west, and they're built for a Uyghur population. But that transformation, that use of clearly foreign architecture occurred in China much earlier. And it wasn't really a transformation. It was an implant on Chinese soil. And so how can this come about? Well, so it's not just that it is permanent materials. And actually, there's a precedent for this. What I would call the most successful import of a foreign of architecture to serve a foreign faith is another building system that requires or that came with permanent materials. So you're looking at a Buddhist pagoda on the right. It required in the early centuries CE, a transformation of three architectural forms that had not existed in China, the relic mound, the worship space carved into natural rock, and what becomes a monastery, the vihara, the space for monastic prayer and residence, monk cells. And in this case, there would have been a stupa in the center. And they transform to the pagoda and to the Buddha hall. And I've chosen here an interior of a cave, but the Buddha hall worship in caves, because there aren't caves all over China, will become wood frame, Chinese building system and will become a monastery such as you see here. But the pagoda, and I made this point in a discussion yesterday and I have, I have a few really good examples of what I was saying. The pagoda, no matter if you make it in wood, which this one isn't, or if you simulate uh, roof tiles and pillars and bracket sets, it sticks out unnaturally 
in the Chinese built environment with whose landscape is low and whose buildings spread out in courtyards along the horizontal. And in fact, there can be one, there can be two, there can be no pagodas in a monastery. It, it's not necessary. And the Chinese never exactly, architecturally, never exactly come to terms with it. So now I come here <clears throat> to look at the second factor that has to happen. The first is, yes, permanent materials, but China knows how to deal with this, even if church architecture didn't do it for most of its history in China. The second is what I would call the process of incorporation into Chinese space. And so I start here with the only minaret that survives that looks like this in China proper. This one was, uh, is dated to 1350, but it is described by local Chinese who lived in Guangzhou, formerly known as Canton, uh, in the 12th century. And one Chinese literatus writes about stairs being inside. It's not known if he was allowed to go in. Unlikely, he was a Muslim. But it projects, but not, but is incorporated here. So you, we, we are inside the mosque on the right, and this is a plan. So you can see the minaret is right here. But the plan of the monastery, which may or may not have changed size of, of the monastery, I have to catch myself, of the mosque, is T-shaped approach, enclosing corridor main hall with an enormous platform in front and then a corridor around it. So I took something from the 11th century, not maybe the best example, but I'm trying to look to pre 14th century. The main building here is approached by stairs and then a large platform. And here's the enclosing corridor and building on the side. At the mosque, the worshiper has to turn to the right and then turn 90 degrees and entrance is here because this is the mihrab. But it is completely transformed into Chinese architectural space. It's not concealed. If there were any concern about oppression of Islam, then uh, there's a way to conceal worship space in the walls of Chinese architecture. Everybody knew about this enormous uh, minaret. It projects over 37 meters. In fact, there are some theories that it was used as a lighthouse uh, to bring people into the harbor. But the same occurs for the White Pagoda. And so you can see I'm using commercial uh, slides here. I couldn't, I've never been able to take this picture. Many of you have been to Beijing. You've seen uh, the pagoda at the Miaoying Monastery built 1279 that is enclosed in Chinese architectural space. In a building plan that traces at least to the sixth century in China, and I've chosen four plans of monasteries from Korea just to bring Korea into here in some way, and Japan now in uh, the seventh century. Gate, pagoda, Buddha hall, lecture hall that sometimes attaches. That's the plan that you just saw. The observatory made of brick. People look at it and people emphasize the fact that there were Muslim observers working in China under, during the period of Mongol rule in the 13th century. We have no idea what earlier observatories looked like in China. We only know that they existed. And there were Chinese working in Muslim observatories at the same time. But the building materials were available in China, but look at the plan that it's put into. Gate, pavilion in the first courtyard, second courtyard, symmetrical pavilions. This right here is one of them. And then the main structure. Here's the plan, and here's a plan of an 11th century Chinese Buddhist monastery. Now we come to the Beitong. 
So when many people on the screen look at a picture or go to the bait tongue, yep, the eyes are directed right to the structure. But actually the first thing that I noticed because it's how my eyes work, were the two pavilions, the steely pavilions on either side. And I, I, thank, I thank Professor Anthony Clark for this picture. It's even better than what I was hoping uh, to get. So, okay, here's a gate. Here's our T-shaped approach. Here's our main structure. People were talking about the kind of fortress-like structure that some of the churches take in China. Uh, in the early 20th century. But what's happened here has happened here and happens here. This is a Taoist monastery. The main structure should be on the main building line with parallel courtyards and buildings fit into them around courtyards. And because it's come up and we haven't really been able to answer specifically what was Gresnik looking at? What kinds of pictures were available? Well, printed books with pictures of architectural space exist all over China. I'm sure he did not look at this book, which is from a very local record of where this monastery was built. It's this Taoist monastery, but buildings along a main line, that, but this is printed in the 19th century. So buildings along a main line and then parallel axes of courtyards. So in other words, incorporation into Chinese architectural space is also not at all a problem. The third point has come up just a little bit, but I want to emphasize it and I, so I chose structures with some circular construction. This is the altar of heaven, and this is an earlier altar of heaven. It came up that architectural space in church architecture can be modular. One of the important current thrusts of, of uh, research in China is that not only is the building modular, but the space of courtyards is modular and it can extend from a small courtyard all the way to the entire city of Beijing. And so I chose just a few churches showing you the kinds of modular space into which church architecture, no matter what material it's made of, can fit. And then I couldn't help but do this because there's always the visual, there is no problem with a large image for worship. This is from the year 984, Buddhist deity, uh, obviously, but there's no problem with worship of, of the large image. And then I decided I had to put these in or keep them in because they hadn't come up. One of the most extraordinary things I saw when I was at the Beitong were these two paintings of Madonna and child one, and I don't know who did them, somebody on the screen might, but one is in Ming dress and one is in Qing dress. So the dress of the court in the 16th or 15th, probably 16th century, the dress of the court in the 18th century, this ability to adapt within the Chinese system isn't just architecture. It's what we've called the decoration, it's the paint, it's a full service move in adaption or adaptation or in corporation. The fourth point is something that hasn't come up very much, but probably a lot of people have read um, Anthony Clark's book, China Gothic. And one of the things that impressed me in that book is that what's behind the construction of a church? The, the priest is there but he's a servant of the state and a servant of the state or the church lowercase and the church capital C. Nothing can be built in China, nothing religious, nothing public without the sanction of the government. And this can be on very small scale, a temple in the mountains, if not a local magistrate, the people of the town have to get together and raise money and support it. 
And through history, a Buddhist priest who was commissioned by the government of Japan to come and bring a new form of Buddhism. So he goes to Japan, a Japanese priest who goes to China and studies a new kind of Buddhism, which he brings back to Japan, a Buddhist priest who is in charge of reconstruction of a monastery and brings, some people think that Chogen got to China, but it's not positive. Um, brings craftsmen from the mainland to build these three buildings, which I now put into a slide with mosque building. The visual is very powerful and they can function for Buddhism, for Islam in China, et cetera, et cetera. I think that we are looking, what we're looking at here. And so this is the pattern into which a church like Dali easily functions also within a courtyard. I think that we are looking at two systems which are used, bar, happens all the time, borrowed from the natural sciences and they work really well for architectural history. The first is convergence, which evolutionary biologists describe as the process whereby unrelated organisms come together to evolve similar characteristics as the result of similar environments or similar ecological systems. This is, this is convergence. The two become one. And this is the process in so many of the mosques that I showed you. The other phenomenon is architectural entanglement. And I, I first learned about this in 2017 when I went to a conference on architectural entanglement. Uh, it's a theory that was, it's a, uh, it comes out of uh, physics, physical phenomenology. It was first proposed by Einstein uh, that occurs when pairs or groups of particles are generated, interact, or share spatial proximity such that the state of each particle cannot be described independent of the state of the others, even when the particles are separated by a large distance. Architectural entanglement, so that's now, now architect, architectural historians have now their own definition here, is defined by a building that cannot be considered independent or fully understood without awareness of buildings beyond it, even though one cannot confirm the direct influence of those other buildings in its construction. This is entanglement. This Tibetan Lama structure entangles the Chinese built environment and they can no longer be thought of independently. China entangles it, but they stand together and so, this is a process that's at work. And I wanted to mention it because of an extraordinary excavation site, which is my best evidence of architectural entanglement. And, uh, or maybe it's convergence. I can actually make a case for both of them, but it's my segue into the first early period of great uh, church construction in China, this thir 13th century. So this is the excavation plan that was made, uh, published in 1949 by the Soviet archeologist, Sergei Kislyev, who was excavating in Transbaikal, that's Southern Russia today. And Kislyev included in his excavation report, these stone pieces that interlock into the balustrade or other parts of the perimeter of a building, which survive in great numbers in Mongolia and have been excavated at Kublai Khan Xanadu and have been excavated at another Mongol capital, the central capital that actually will come up again. This is the circa 2020, the 2010-ish. Uh, 20 this is the 21st century uh, excavation plan and it is not a cruciform. So Kislyev and others thought, well, maybe this was a church. They thought this because of the cruciform plan. 
And there will be a few points when I mention we can't really jump and say, yes, anything that's cross-shaped was a church. Some of the churches, including one in Kublai's capital are supposed to have been cross-shaped. Uh, this is not a church, this was palatial architecture. And I'll get back there in just a moment because this is another example of a jump during the Mongol period. So now I'm in Eastern Azerbaijan, uh, I'm East Azerbaijan, I'm in uh, Northwestern Iran. And these are the Maraga caves, which were used during the Mongol period. And Andre Godar was, uh, I'm not sure if he was an archeologist as much as someone studying Maraga and walking around and taking pictures, but he published this and he not only thought that this might be a church, he actually went on to say, well, maybe this church, in a, it's, it's in a cave, was where the wives of the Mongols worshiped. There were Mongol women who, had con who did convert to Christianity. And then he went on to say, perhaps this is where Bar Hebraeus prayed in the 13th century. Bar Hebraeus was also in Maraga. Um, 1226 to 1286 are his dates. There was a library there and he did pray here. Did he pray in these caves? Well, this is the 21st century plan of the same caves. So here's Godar's cruciform, but actually the caves extend much farther to the west with entrances there. And this is what the caves look like. And there are theories that, no, I've never been there. It's someplace I would give a talk like this. Anyone wants to invite me to Iran to see, <laughs> to see the caves, I'd be very happy to accept the invitation. This is, these are pictures I get off the web. Um, these are, some people believe these were used for Buddhist worship. There was Buddhism in Iran in, uh, the 13th century. Uh, the current Iranian theory is that maybe they were used for Mithraism. Uh, I think that's a stretch, but that's to deflect attention to the fact that Buddhism was in Iran until the Mongol period and then the conversion to Islam. But this is convergence or entanglement or what goes on with architecture as people change and systems change. Now, as for Kondoy, and here I have to thank uh, the excavator, uh, Nikolai Kradin. Uh, the, this is a, a Soviet, uh, a, a, a Russian Academy of Sciences excavation running out of, of Vladivostok for sending me what I'm about to show you. These roof tiles were found at the Kondoy Palace. I've already showed you these. And these are some old pictures of a Russian Orthodox church in the town of Kondoy, uh, for which in the year 1805, there is a record that stone was procured by local residents. So this procured is a translation of what the, the way the Russian uh, excavators describe what they found here. So let's just use the word procured. This is what the church looks like today. And here are those pieces of stone. And here it is believed are the pieces of inserts onto the perimeter of a building that I just showed you. This is convergence. And building materials have kind of come up they, in this conference, but building materials are out there. Someone uh, mentioned where were people getting the stone for churches, where, where were the quarries, where was the brick being brought from. M building permanent materials exist when older buildings are torn down and they come to have new lives and new converged purposes. And since we're talking about Mongolia, this is a place ripe for research. And so I, th I would call this uh, an example of entanglement where we have a tent where Christianity is being practiced with the cross. And here we have the dome, uh, dome of a Mongol tent in a cathedral. Both of these are in or just outside of Ulaanbaatar. 
So as I was planning this talk and knowing that there would be many talks before me in which many things would come up, I didn't want to have to try to rewrite everything the night before or two nights before. So I put in material that I hope wouldn't come up and fortunately it hasn't. I want to turn now to the first major period of church architecture. Now, somebody, many of you on the screen know the history of the church in China and know that there was, was the practice of Christianity occurred at least in the Tang Dynasty and there are steely to that effect, but I'm interested in physical evidence of church architecture. Physical evidence does not survive from the seventh, eighth, or ninth centuries. This is where the physical evidence survives in its oldest form. So if you are, if you've been wondering why I put this picture in the desert, desert, I'm in the Ordos of Inner Mongolia here behind me. This is the region. The what I I, I start in Olon Sum, and this is in Baoto County of Inner Mongolia. So here's Baoto right here. Here's Hohut, the capital of Inner Mongolia. Here's the Ordo, so I'm more over here. Here is Chahar that is going to come up. And here's Beijing and Kublai's capital, his Xanadu is up here. So Olon Sum is a site associated with the Ongut and who converted to Church of the East. The Ongut Chinese name uh, is Wanggu. They're believed to be descendants of an inner Asian people who were in Eastern Xinjiang already in the seventh century. And the, the Ongut uh, are documented from the 12th century and are documented by written records by Marco Polo, by John of Monte Corvino, and Rabban Sama. John of Monte Corvino, he's better known by the name Archbishop of Kanbalik or Archbishop of Beijing. He does build churches in Beijing, but he was here and he, he writes a letter to the Pope and he says that he converted uh, the ruler George from Church of the East, that is the, the Christianity practiced by the uh, people, uh, by the Ongut in Olon Sum, what we used to call Nestorianism, that he converted him to Catholicism. And he built his own church here. And Rabban Salma also was here, for those of you who don't know him, his dates are 1220 to 1294. He is a church, a member of the Church of the East who comes from Beijing and goes to Jerusalem on pilgrimage and then on his way back, he ends up uh, dying in Baghdad. So he never makes it back to China. Uh, John of Monte Corvino is said to have converted King George in the year 1298. I've been here twice, most recently in 2018, where I was shocked <laughs> to see these statues. And this is the clearest picture I have of them. I don't want to look at a picture and say that it's a Christian because this could be a could be a civil official and a military official. But these statues were still there. A museum is being built in the town. Uh, and this material, which is well published from Olon Sum, was already in the town. I haven't seen any of it, but there's definite evidence of Church of the East including tombstones and other, and this is a sarcophagus. The Belgian missionary Cesar de Brabondé and his dates are 1857 to 1919, may have been the first European since Mongol times to see and report on Christian remains near Bauto in Inner Mongolia. He saw and sketched seven gravestones with crucifixes and lotuses. Now, this is something that I learned in one of the talks that we had in the last two days. I learned that often missionaries would do sketches and then 
somebody would go out and photograph what they had sketched. No photographs, as far as I know, survived from him, uh, but there were sketches and I suspect that they are somewhere and uh, maybe uh, some of the people who have done more active research on this kind of material even have seen Brabande sketches or know where they might be. But he, he writes that he saw seven or eight uh, tombstones. He saw, he saw seven gravestones with crucifixes and lotuses. Some of them seven or eight feet high, two feet wide, one foot deep, about four hours drive from his mission, but to the east. So uh, uh, to, uh, from his, to the west from his mission, to, to the west of Zhang Jiakou. And then someone, uh, a missionary went back and he was told that Buddhist monks had taken about 10 of the gravestones as well as a white stone cross and used them in building a monastery. So this reuse of space for a completely different kind of space is happening all the time between all faiths. And it'd be interesting to know what the Buddhists did with the crucifix, but th those records aren't here either. Brabande did not make associations with the uh, location where probably the largest number of Christian material survives, the port city Chuanjo, where there's also a lot of Islamic material and Manich some Manichaean material and Brahmanical material, et cetera. But he did know that there, were, that there was architecture of the church in the vicinity of uh, Beijing. And he also, and he also brought out pieces of a stele that be, or photographed. They actually, I don't even know where the pieces are. He photographed a stele that comes to be known as the Wanggu stele, Wanggu, the Chinese name for Ongut, that were sent to Europe and the pieces were translated. And the name King George, came, this King George who John of Monte Corvino had converted, came up in the translations. King George, King George's first wife was a daughter of Kublai Khan. As I mentioned, Marco Polo met him. John of Monte Corvino takes credit for converting him. But even before the pieces of the stele came out, Paul Paleo emphasized that the name that was translated as George, the Syriac Giwargus, could also be Corgus, and that there had been many Corgus and Giwargus, including some that had nothing to do with Christianity, one person who had been influential in Persian affairs in China in the 13th century. So we'll hold that thought. Uh, in the 1930s, Egami Namio mapped. He was Japanese archaeologist. He did some excavation. And then after 1934-35, uh, was never able to come back and finish. But he produced this map. And it's not the most recent. Chinese have excavated it in the 21st century. But it's a very beautiful map. And it has what we are interested in. He found several sites with architecture. And he suggested that he found two churches. He couldn't confirm it, but he saw the Christian remains. And he said that uh, if there were two, one was Church of the East and the other was Monte Corvino's now Catholic church. When a site has a limited excavation history, is the repository of exotica is one of the largest repositories of this kind of exotica. It's from the Mongol period and has a history that's been reconstructed based on fragments of a stone that the people translating the stone have never seen. It cannot but attract theories and those theories are always very long lived. And so one of the theories that has emerged uh, goes back to Marco Polo who talks about Prester John. And uh, Prester John is, it, it, and so Marco Polo wrote that King George was a descendant of Prester John, who 
it, who probably was legendary. There may be people on the screen who disagree with me, but I will say was probably legendary. And these are some of the books that make that argument. Um, whose patriarchy over Church of the East had begun in the 12th century and involved Ethiopia, India, Western Europe, and East and West Asia. This takes us to this building, which I'm pretty sure no one has seen. I put on the Chinese characters because there are two Guyan of importance during the Mongol period in China. And this is in Northern Hebei province, but near the border with Inner Mongolia and in this territory that I called Chahar, that I referred to as Chahar. So the Chahar is the name from the period of the 18th century when this region was mapped and studied, uh, mapping and studying commissioned by the court of the Qianlong Emperor. So the documents come uh, in the the documents come in the 17 in the 1730s to 1740s, and then there's a later revision in 1754. But they this it's this region, and this building was seen then, and the name Comb and Makeup Tower, Xu Chuang Lo, is given to this building with the association therefore that, oh, a woman was here. This is the territory that had been given to one of the dowagers of the Liao dynasty. Maybe this is a Liao building. Well, that's very unlikely, but people like to associate things with Liao, things of Liao with things that uh, are not very well known. But what is known, is that this building, just looking at the architecture, because there's nothing here that tells us more than that, is what's called a dome on square, nicknamed a dome on square. And it is a type of Muslim mausoleum, a standard type. There are two in China today, but not in what I've already used the word China proper, not in China's core provinces. There's one in Karakoto, which was destroyed in 12, the city walls were destroyed in 1227 by the Mongols. There's, this has been refaced. It's not clear who would have been buried here. Uh, the tomb of Tukluk, Lamor, Tukluk Timur has excellent documentation. He's a descendant of Genghis Khan. He dies in 1363. His Khanate converts to Islam as does he a little bit earlier. And this has been open studied. This is definitely a Muslim tomb of a type with excellent pedigree across the lands of what we call Inner Asia from Western Xinjiang to the uh, Samar to places like Samarkand and Bukhara, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, and the tomb of Buyan Kuli Khan has a very close date. So what do we do with this building? Well, again, in modern times, the, uh, the Qing dynasty, you might consider the 18th century modern times, but the first European record we have of this building, again, is a missionary record. Uh, the missionary name is Hermann A. Hermann, who saw the building in the late 19th century and he publishes a notice of it in Mission en Chine et au Congo. And this is a periodical that I mentioned when we were having some speaker discussions the other day. This is supposed to be in microfilm in the Princeton Theological Seminary. And when it reopens, I will finally track it down and see if I can see if there's a picture. But I know about, I know about this because as recently as 1979, Henry Sorois, another missionary and a superior Mongolologist and Sinologist published this and mentions Hirman and quotes Hirman who writes, this imposing building, a square tower topped by a cupola, I'm quoting now, is where Kublai Khan gathered his herds 
And he ends by declaring that it's possible that under these ruins, the steely and tombstone with inscriptions that relate the history of past centuries, perhaps of illustrious Christians will be found. And then he quotes Brabande, and he mentions the crosses that Brabande saw not too far away. Now, it's not only missionary literature that will see a building like this and make a leap to say that there's going to be a steely here that, that tells the history of the Christians at the time of Genghis Khan. In 1925, a man named Lawrence Impe was here, and he was here searching for Xanadu. And several have made the trip. There's some good travel accounts of the search for Kublai City. It's an open archeological site today. But in 1925, it wasn't. And Impe publishes a very small black and white picture of this. This is what the building looks like inside. And so I got a little ahead of my story, but let's stay with my pictures and then I'll continue the story. This, uh, these features here, cornices, to someone looking from China appear as bracket sets, but to someone looking uh, for a Muslim tombstone, they appear as mukarnas, which are features, the honeycomb-like interface at cornices between a dome and a uh, enclosure of flat sides. So again, it depends where one looks. This is the slide I wanted. John Mann may or may not be a name that's known to you. He's written more than 20 books. He definitely does research for his books, but they're semi-popular. And in his book, Xanadu, he puts in a footnote that says, we don't know anything about Lawrence Impe. Maybe he was a spy. So <laughs> this kind of sensationalist understanding of not only Mongol period material, but buildings built of permanent materials, and a lot of them with Christian connotations, also is very much out there. Impe, of course, is in this part of Mongolia when Brezhnev uh, is in China or just before. The next person who came here was Wang Beichan. He was here in 1993 and 1995. And in 1996, as he lay dying on his hospital bed, he calls in his good friend, Lin Meitzwan, who is a name probably known to some of you here, very eminent archeologists of Mongol period China. And he's dictating to Lin on his deathbed, an article with the promise that it will come out posthumously, and it does. So, uh, anyone who envisions those last moments, no one, no one questions a, the, the seriousness of any scholar, but this is literally what Wang Beichan was doing in his last moments on earth. And the article comes out and there is a theory about who is in this tomb. And, uh, and he probably knew that excavation was going to take place, it did. It occurred between uh, 1999 and 2002. And this is as when I say open archeology span side, the two times I was here, I saw this. I don't, last time was 2018. I don't know what's here today. So there's a male flanked by two females. Uh, well, was he, if he's a pure Muslim, if he's a Sunni Orthodox Muslim, he should be right in the ground. He should be encased in white cloth and his head should be on the side. And there actually were burial goods. Uh, the, the objects were still on site, but this is also a place where a museum is being built. And by now uh, things may have been moved off site into the museum in town. But Wang Bei Chun had a theory that's easiest for me to explain here, a theory that this has to be a Muslim tomb because the architecture tells us it's a Muslim tomb. He believes that the tomb belonged to Ananda. This is a Buddhist name. Uh, Ananda was a disciple of the historical Buddha Shakyamuni. 
the son of Mangala, who is the son of Kublai Khan. So Kublai's grandson, Mangala owns these lands that include the city of Xi'an. He owns vast territory. And at the remains of Mangala's, um, whatever remains of his palace or architecture, at those remains, a magic square with Arabic numerals, literally Arabic numerals, was excavated. This is Kublai Khan's descendant who dies without a, a, an heir. So for the next person to succeed Kublai's descendant, the succession either should go to a grandson or to a great grandson. And this man executes Ananda. It's not really that hard to get someone executed or get someone killed uh, during the period of Mongolian rule. Kaishan has him executed, becomes the emperor. Uh, he only lasts for four years and then his younger brother becomes the emperor and that was negotiated before uh, Kaishan took the throne. But Kaishan builds a new capital, the central capital from which I showed you excavations before. He builds a new capital and about 20 kilometers from this mausoleum, from, from this mausoleum that I've shown you, to appropriate for himself and his new capital the lands where this person is buried. This is how the case that this is a Muslim, I have it again, yeah. This is a case for how this would be a Muslim mausoleum has been built. But there also is, just, but then after the initial excavation, these pieces were excavated. And this is the Kuali Jisu, this name we heard before, that's sometimes translated as George, it becomes Georgus in Syriac, but it also can be Korguz. And this gave way to an identification of this as the tomb of King George, who was converted to Christianity. So I leave it to you to decide. This is a topic in the literature right now. Uh, there was in 2011, a, uh, an idea by a Chinese scholar, emphasis that there were many people named Jiwargus, Kuali Jisa, and George, um, and that the one that's buried here actually died in the year 1340. So convergence, entanglement, conflation, this surrounds all the early Christian physical evidence, all the material culture, from the first period, and some of you know others of this other material better. Uh, the tombstone of Andrew Perugia, found in Chuanzhou, a city that I already mentioned, in 1983. Uh, permanent building materials were found here, and there's a theory that maybe part of the church where he preached uh, was excavated. Many of you know about. Um, Catherine and her brother, Anthony, daughter and son of the Italian merchant, uh, merchant Dominic Figlioni, whose tombstones were, her tombstone here, were excavated when the city walls of Yangzhou were torn down in 1951. People know exactly where one of Johnny, John of Monte Corvino's churches was. It's very near the bell and drum towers in the city of Beijing. Nothing's been found. The description is that there were church bells ringing. People look for a steeple, but maybe it is a bell or drum tower. This is a newer church, but this is in Zhenjiang, a city with lots of missionary activity, including where Pearl Buck, a uh, child of missionaries, was born in uh, 1892. But I mentioned this because there was another Xieli Jisa. There was a Sargus here in the year 1281, and materials from seven churches in Zhenjiang were appropriated for Buddhist construction. And again, there's a lot, a lot 
of physical evidence, if it still exists, to be found to see what happens to it. So I wanted to talk about the 13th and 14th centuries, and not only to have material that I knew would have come up, but because it's a better studied period of permanent architecture of Christianity than the period that's received so much attention that has come up that I'll just say one sentence about the period of the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, Giuseppe Castiglione has come up already and Jean-Denis Attere and Michel Benoit and Ignatius Sichelbart. I wanna emphasize, I'm showing some of my favorite Castiglione paintings and everybody knows that the so-called Western mansions in the gardens of the Kangxi and especially the Qianlong Emperor outside the city of Beijing were uh, made by this group and buildings are erected by this group. I want to emphasize that this is a very different period from the 13th and 14th centuries and that the 20th century falls between them. The period of the 13th century and the 14th centuries were periods when Christians and Muslims from the West were practicing their religion in China. And especially large numbers of Muslims who built mosques for themselves, who lived in seaports for 15 months because of the trade winds that they had a get their dock, get their permissions from the superintendency, get their goods moved, and then they would have to wait until the wind blew the other way. So they lived, they worshiped, they married, they died. And, they, and, and the churches or mosques built for this group, churches or mosques built for Christians or Muslims in the 13th and 14th centuries, were used for living religions of the population. The impact of people like Castiglione had much more limited impact outside the court. They're educating the court in math and science, but they're not allowed to convert in to the extent that's happened by the time we come to the late 19th or the early 20th century. And so what we have from them, the beautiful paintings, we don't have the kind of evidence, and I'm not even sure that it should be considered the same way or in the same discussions when we talk about the early period or the late period, the number of Europeans practicing Christianity in China in the 18th century, I think was negligible. I mean, maybe somebody will uncover other records. So to wind up, I said it was gonna take me a long time to do this, but to begin to wind up, to turn to, well, to turn to the year 1840, which is the year that Chinese architectural historians mark as the beginning of modern architecture. It's a logical marking, even though you have 1860 down here, but 1839 to 41, the first opium war, and the Treaty of Nanking, or Treaty of Nanking, let's call it that, cedes Hong Kong to Great Britain and opens Guangzhou, Xiamen, Fuzhou, Ningbo, and Shanghai, the treaty ports. Second Opium War. This, this is what Westerners know because of the destruction of the so-called Western mansions, but the Treaty of Tianjin lets France, Russia, and the United States have legations, 10 more treaty ports open. Taiping Rebellion, 1850 to 64, that's come up at this conference of moving south from the city of Nanjing. The problems at the Sino-Russian and the Sino-Japanese borders haven't come up, but they were large and looming between 1894 to 1895, 1904 to 1905. China's fighting Japan over Korea, and then the Boxer Rebellion in 1900. What's happened right before Gresnik comes to China is an unparalleled upheaval in China's history with the understanding that everything must change, not just architecture. There was European architecture in China 
before this period in the treaty ports. They've come up, the buildings haven't come up. Guangzhou, of course, Wuhan, of course, Tianjin, of course, and Shanghai, of course, among others. But this is the China wherever he traveled that Gresnik saw. He certainly knew, he certainly saw modern, if I can, I will use the word modern because modern doesn't mean contemporary. He certainly saw modern buildings when he came to China. And I would like to end by comparing what he did with what three other men in China were doing at the same time. The first is Henry Murphy. Uh, Professor Kumans has written about Murphy. He's done these kinds of comparisons. Murphy is known for this phrase, adaptive architecture. He and, he and Gresnik are born the same year. Murphy educated at Yale. He makes eight trips to China. One of them, uh, his longest and last, 1931 to 1935. Gresnik on the left, Murphy on the right, and what we are calling adaptive architecture is perhaps a very good name for what we're looking at, but uh, there's a little bit more to it than this. Murphy, by the way, also had to deal with the board. Um, Murphy has to deal with people who are funding him. Yes, the point was made. He did make a lot more money than a clergyman, but Murphy has to keep his patrons as happy uh, as Gresnik has to keep his patrons. And so something that hasn't come up, and I'm drawing here from research that was done by Lai Dolin, who's been on, I don't know Lai if you're, Dolin, if you're on today, but this is, I think, very important in understanding what's happening in modern architecture with foreigners building in China. This is a drawing uh, that was, this was done around 1918 for a painter who was working for Murphy. This is a rendering for Fujian Christian University. And many know, I think it might've come up that Murphy designed the Tsinghua Auditorium uh, on the campus of Tsinghua University. And so now I wanna make a point that also, I think this came up a little bit yesterday, but I wanna make it more strongly. Many of the universities that came to China, the first real universities in a European sense or Western sense did come from Europe and the United States and they offered a new kind of education. In pre-modern China, Confucian and humanistic education is happening at academies. All the way since the, these can be traced to the Song Dynasty, the White Deer Academy, one of the most famous. And math and science are being taught in places like observatories. And the university mixes this education into, it was, it was mentioned yesterday, one fortress inside one set of walls. So that, yes, um, Murphy, Murphy and Dana, his partner at one time, certainly saw the Low Library at Columbia but they are also building a new kind of university, which is going to have in it a building that in some ways even functions like a church. An auditorium is what we find in every university today. It's a public space, it's for student gathering. It's also a space for performance. And so the building of a university is not just the university business as usual. This is, all, this is also something that had to come to China. The third group who are building universities uh, are what we call China's first generation. They have also come up. Liang Sichang, the most famous Liang Sichang, the one who we mentioned. They all studied abroad. This group you see here, either in the United States or in uh, Japan, a few of them studied in France. This is a group leaving China. It came up that the practice of architecture only gets going at the beginning of the 20th century in China. And in this design for a modern China, the visual 
is also extremely important. And this hasn't come up in quite this way. The visual, Beaux Arts, bold symmetry, use for civic architecture, grandeur, and lots of exterior decoration finds its way from Beaux Arts. Oh, this is very compatible. Beaux Arts, this is very compatible. Even this. The Beaux Arts education that Chinese students learned outside of China and brought back is the education that Murphy had, is the education, as it turns out, that Russians who would come as Soviet advisors to China had, and presumably Gresnik had, stu Gresnik had studied similarly, so that a Beaux Arts rendering can easily have Chinese pieces put into it, and the buildings by the first generation. So these are three buildings. Yang Ting Bao's name came up yesterday. Nanjing University, civic architecture, bold grandeur decoration is also coming to China, is in universities across China. The, this university, the buildings you see here, were also designed by Yang Ting Bao. This is when uh, Chinese academia moved to the Southwest uh, to make to try to stay away from the Japanese bombings. And it's still the architectural tradition of the 1950s. Uh, this building, of course, uh, built before then for the Republican government. But this one, 1950s, Zhang Kaiji in um, San Li He, the government building, and so-called minorities cultural palace. These are the buildings, and these are the buildings in Taiwan that were all around and come, I would argue, out of the same mold. And so the last person I wanted just to give a little notice of Ernst Bershman, because he's trained as an engineer and he comes to China in the military service in 1902 to design for the military, some similarities and some parallels in the career. He designs a hospital, but he spends most of three decades in China. And what he's left is a photographic record. And uh, Bershman definitely knew Lian Zichang. I'm wondering if somehow Gresnik uh, met him. We don't know that. But what we do know is that from four different groups, the mission and the mandate to build a new China that included universities was very similar. I put in Lu Yanzhi uh, as the architect because Bershman didn't really build. And what we are seeing in these buildings is two things. The first is reinforced concrete, which hasn't been emphasized enough. Brick, steel, reinforced concrete. There's no turning back for China. These, these materials allow for plumbing and they allow for heating systems. But what you're really seeing in all these buildings is that big roof which had been the definer of Chinese architecture for 2000 years before Gresnik ever came to China. And it did, as I've mentioned, what bracket sets couldn't do because it can be seen from afar and lends itself to what I would call Sino-modern. That's the term that I like for this. Church, hospital, auditorium, museum, designed by foreigners or designed by people, uh, by Chinese who were trained abroad, always using reinforced concrete or brick. No matter what churches had looked like in the past, they of course were not the agenda. Costantini knew this and we've talked about that a lot. They were not the agenda in the 1920s. The agenda was Chinese architecture but it was labeled as Sino-Christian, Sino-Western, Sino-European by Gresnik and Murphy, and as Sino-Modern by Liang Zichang. Actually, I would call it global modern. And I'm not using the word contemporary 
or Chinese have a word even beyond contemporary, which would be dang dai or dang dang dai, what was built yesterday. I'm using, this, using it to refer to this period of the 1910s, 1920s, and 1930s that's made possible by steel and concrete. Remarkably, the adaptability of the Chinese architectural system to this new modernity was as straightforward as it had been for a thousand years earlier. And this perhaps is the ultimate beauty of the Chinese architectural system. It was a new agenda for a century different from any that had come before it, but perhaps not coincidentally for architects and Soviet advisors, we might say five, came up with very, very similar solutions. Well, I've exceeded my time. Thank you for your patience, but I'm finished. So let me, let me see if I can. Professor Steinhardt, um, I think there is a group applause <laughs> happening uh, virtually. So thank you. Uh, one, of the, one of the first rules of academic etiquette is that the keynote speaker absolutely is granted as much time as she or he <laughs> wishes. So I, I just want to, there, there, are, there are more questions than we can answer between now and 9.30. Um, but I just want to say a couple of things. One is um, you mentioned the idea of convergence. Uh, you mentioned uh, Henri Soroyce, who was the brother of my academic grandfather, Paul Soroyce, who was a scoot father from Belgium. Ah, so we have that connection. I see. I bet and, I, well, that, I said I didn't know. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, I was in Bauto in 1996 and had no idea uh, uh, about Olan Sume myself. And so I learned that. But I also want to say that for those of us who specialize in Sino Christian history, I think you just pressed us to be more motivated. You may have uh, mentioned, I did not, I never would have known that you may have just pointed out to many of us the tomb, the earliest known tomb of a Christian. Um, well, so that, again, there, there's a large group who want to see it as Christian. <laughs> the architecture, I'm, I'm probably leaning on the Muslim side. <laughs> oh, okay. No. But, but, but it's, there's, there's a lot of literature, you know, but TBD, right? Then a Christian took a dome on square. So, yeah. Right, right. Well, we do have some questions. And rather than, um, rather, and I do have just about a one and a half minute, some closing remarks, but rather than reading them myself, I think I would just... There are three people. There, there are so many more questions, actually. As, as, as long as you want me to stay, I can stay. I knew I would talk over, and I didn't shorten it. And, you know, that was just I, have, I have a script, but when I leave it, it always takes a little bit longer. So. Oh, goodness gracious. No, that was marvelous. Let's just begin. I think we'll end, I'm, I'm guessing, still around 9.30, 9.35 at the latest. But um, Professor Stephanie Wong, you have a question. So perhaps just unmute. Uh, ask. We, at this point, we should just openly ask uh, without ha having me read the chat. Professor Wong. Thank you so much for that presentation. What do you make of the role of intention in these processes of convergence or entanglement? I saw your talk is really emphasizing the way that Christian and Muslim buildings have worked with Chinese patterns and over time have, have participated in Chinese architecture. But we, many of us in this symposium have been worried about sort of the intentional top-down mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. condensed mm -hmm. campaign of the Holy See at this time. Do you think we're over worrying about that aspect of the artificiality well, of it all, or is this not, just normal not, in history? No, I think we're not over worrying over, over worrying when we become historians instead of participants. It's our job to over worry and then figure out what's most important. I think that the builders are just laborers, whether they're Christians or Chinese or converts or whoever they are. The, 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 the decision to build does come from the top, so there has to be some intention. But I think that the end product may or may not always, you know, always end up, end up showing intentionality. I think that when what we're talking about at this conference involves many forces, and we all kind of skirt around politics, but there's there's a dramatic political environment 
that's changing and war going on every moment in some part of China or at some border while people like Gresnik are building and while Liang Sichang is working and embattling his own nation in politics. Um, I don't know if intentionality, if, 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 if things start intentionally, maybe they don't always end up that way. I think it's harder to talk about intentionality when we talk about the 13th, 14th centuries, or, and, and I think the 17th, 18th century, which is ripe for so much research and people on, in this conference have done a lot of research on the period. Christianity in China is for a very different audience. Maybe audience is, is part, is, is a way to think about what you trying to, what we're trying to define as intentionality, maybe audience or participants is, is a way to think about it. One of the things that struck me also yesterday when we looked at pictures of churches and villages in the countryside, this is really grassroots Christianity for Chinese Christians. It's very different. From Gresnik is also building a symbol of the church, capital C, and he's building a modern university. So really, I think when we're talking about the 20th century, which is the subject here, it's, a very, it's very complicated. Um, and there are probably a lot of agendas, you know, with intentionality. Professor Menegon. Yeah, my question is uh, in the chat, actually. Can you hear me? Yes, I, and I can also look at the chat if I can find yeah, it. I was to asking, see if it's wrong, so. Yeah, I was asking Professor Steiner if you have a sense whether the work of Oswald Siren that came out exactly at that time, he was uh, in the early 20s in Beijing doing all kinds of architectural drawings, had an influence on Western architects in China. So they knew about, Liang Sichang knew about Siren because Liang Sichang spent time uh, at Yale and at um, Harvard, and he went to a conference at Princeton. And at Harvard, one of the things he did was he used Seren's book, he was taking art history. Now, this is, this is the reason that I mentioned um, Birschmann, who publishes almost exclusively in German and that one of his books got translated. But I wondered if, if uh, Gresnicht came across Birschmann's writings, I've won, I mean, this is something some of you on the screen actively do this research. You're sitting in Europe now, you're using archives and using libraries that someone like Birchman might have used. Um, I, maybe, I, I, I would, I think it would be logical that those were, picture, were pictures he looked at, Saran was all over, but that's why I mentioned Birchman. Birchman was all, the, his books were all over Europe, as far as I know. Um, they're still available. They're a little bit harder to get now, but yeah. And so that's why I showed the, ga the page from the local record from the Gazetteer, because there are printed books that show what architecture looks like that are all over. So one, one would think, right, that he's using books, but I can't prove it, but maybe people who actively worked on Gresnik will prove this for us. We do have another question by Professor David Wong, if you could unmute and ask your question. I uh, just appreciated your presentation very much. Uh, the remark I put on the uh, chat is simply that I, as you were talking about architectural entanglement, I was thinking of Nicholas Steinhardt's um, definition of enculturation. Uh, okay. And just, just the rich connections between that. And even the, the point that I raised yesterday about this, the internet connectivity is by definition a, a first opportunity to um, entangle uh, <laughs> at the cyber level in the big time. And, and it's had major impact on um, insofar as architectural design thinking. So that was a remark, but, it's, but I, I, I do have a question though. I, could you just real quickly, the four factors, one is the use of permanent materials. Okay. Well, the yeah, process these are, of incorporation these into Chinese space. What were three and four? I may have sort of- Yes. Yeah, so uh, those were those were the first two, and uh, this uh, the second is the use of the module, Mod modular space as it modular draws space. out, and and the third is that there has to be 
hopefully a symbiotic. There has to be involvement and a relationship between the clergy and the government. Between the what and the government? Well, the clergy and the government. Okay. And, yeah. and, and, it, and, and it includes the local government who gives permission and gives land, but also that body governing the church. Um, all, the, all the Buddhist Buddhist priests, and people use the word priest sometimes instead of monk, but the Buddhist monks all live in monasteries that are responsible to, they can't get themselves into trouble. The government has to approve their existence or, or they're persecuted. And the fourth one? <laughs> that was this involvement with the government. That was the fourth one? The third is the module. The, modu oh, the modu third is the module. Modu Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Steiner. Well, I, I actually, uh, I, I, I am loath to do this, but I have been reminded I am I'm really uh, bound to, to respect time. So uh, there are a great number of uh, questions in the chat area. What I think I'll do for the participants is I'll send the text of the chat uh, to the participants. And, and if you'd like to uh, interact with those uh, questions, that, that, that would be marvelous. I just scribbled, literally scribbled a profuse amount of uh, profusely scribbled notes, but I also scribbled down uh, just about a minute and a half of a, some closing remarks. So I'd like to just read to, to you these closing remarks and then we'll end the symposium, which has been marvelous. This symposium has been a great pleasure for me in several ways, not the least of which has been the, this, the unique opportunity to convene with other scholars of very diverse approaches but with a shared interest in the cultural exchange and ideas uh, of, of and ideas and aesthetics between the West and China. So here's where I just want to admit something. Uh, admit to being a, something of a stodgy classicist when it comes to my own architectural tastes. I prefer Western architecture when it follows classical orders, and I prefer Chinese architecture when it's in continuity with China's long hollow traditional elements. My initial question when this symposium began was, what might it look like when these two aesthetic traditions intertwine like the Taiji or the Yin and Yang of the Song Dynasty and produce a quote, Sino-Christian hybrid? I like Professor Steinhardt's uh, uh, Sino-Modern or uh, uh, a, a, a sort of a different way of thinking about it. The presentations and the keynote address that we just heard have challenged, nuanced, and expanded how I understand the philosophy theology, history, and function of church space in China. As Professor Wang put it, uh, it is what it is. I like what Le Corbusier once asserted, and I also admit to not being a, a great lover of Le Corbusier's architecture, but I, the, the, I, if, I'm safe behind a screen at this moment. Um, he said, quote, architecture is an undeniable event that arises in that instant of creation when the mind finds itself raised by a higher intention than that of simply being useful and shows the poetic powers that animate us and give us joy, close quote. But I also think that perhaps Gresnik or ostensibly Gresnik, as Professor Kumans pointed out, might have the last word. He praised Chinese architecture for, for quote, the restful harmony of its panorama, creating an atmosphere of profound peace, close quote. He juxtaposed Chinese buildings with Western architecture that, quote, seeks to soar aloft in dominating verticals, close quote. Traditional Chinese architecture and traditional uh, Christian architecture in China and Sino-Christian architecture are, I think, being replaced by new soaring and dominating vertical skyscrapers, from Gothic revival to Frank Gehry-esque cityscapes China's Christian built environment has entered a new era, just as photographs printed in dark rooms have been replaced by satellite connected Zoom images. So I'd like to just end the symposium with a semicolon. There's much more that we could discuss. Thank you, dear friends and dear colleagues. What a joy it was. I've seen so many faces, uh, Dr. John Paul Wiest, uh, Professor Lai De Lin, of whom I'd, I'd love to meet in person someday. I hope that the next time we meet, we meet together in person, that we can perhaps drink good Belgian Trappist beer or coffee or more Trappist beer uh, and maybe some good wine and then more Belgian beer. So I just want to thank everyone. Uh, what a joy this has been. 
And uh, those of you who are participants, you should expect to hear from our program assistant very soon. But thank you again, everyone. And I wish you all the most wonderful and safe and healthy uh, of, of, of summers. Shanti Jian Kang. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Virtual Clark. applause for Tony Clark for <laughs> arranging it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.